The sonata number 16 in G major is not one of Beethoven's most famous or popular sonatas, but it is one that upon closer examination will reveal itself to be one of the most unusual and original that Beethoven has ever written. Particularly the outer movements, the first and the third, are like two pocket universes, like science fiction writing in which the author asks some fundamental what-if questions and then sets out to explore these questions and answer them in the story itself. The first movement asks the question, what if it were okay not to play the two hands together? And as any first year student of piano knows, this is usually not a great idea. Uh, it can sound clumsy, it can sound like affectation at worst, and in general this is something to be avoided. And the assumption of us coming to any piece of music is that the hands should be played together. Imagine if we were to start the Appassionata with the hands not together. The effect is completely gone. Or imagine the G major concerto to take something in the same key, the concerto number four. And instead of this beautifully poetic chord with the glow emanating from the piano, I would start Again, the effect is ruined. And yet this is exactly what Beethoven does here. Throughout the entire piece, from the very first, he asks us to play the right hand before the left. This, I would add, is an even bigger affront than playing the left hand before the right. Because sometimes the left comes before the right for emphasis, if we think so the bass appears at first, like a jumping point, and from there we arrive to the chord. This is a possibility. But the right before the left, it is immediately uh, a sign of something not quite right. And to make sure that we don't think that this is just a single mistake by the pianist, the next bits all emphasize this. Then, as a final joke, three chords which are perfectly together. And once Beethoven has asked this unusual question, then he explores it with all the seriousness which he always gives to any of the musical ideas or motives that he writes in his music. And as we discussed several times, a motive in Beethoven doesn't need to be a melody. A motive can be a key, a motive can be a modulation, and a motive like here can be an almost extra musical idea that the hands are not together. And because the core of this idea is humorous, then the movement which he writes is full of humorous elements as well. So I mentioned this um, pseudo-seriousness, but also there is a question of contrasting dynamics. It starts piano. This is all in piano. And all of a sudden, an outburst of forte. But just for a second, because the next one is piano as well. But now, not only that the hands are not together, but he goes to the wrong key. From F major, sorry, from G major, he goes to F major. It is as if the pianist here is represented as someone not quite capable, someone who is a bit clumsy, someone who is to be laughed at as a performer. So not only uh, does the pianist unable uh, to, is the pianist unable to play his hands together, but uh, the pianist can't even figure out the key. So after a bit in um, G major, he said, well, let's try a different key. And even these hesitations in terms of timing, there are wonderful examples of calculated humor. Yes, and... So, outburst in forte, and then these three perfectly together chords. And again... In a 
way, he's here that he launches in the first um, passage, which is not immediately cut into shorter sections. Uh, it is an outburst of bravura, uh, semi-quaver writing, again, almost theatrical. <laughs> Is um, as if someone so annoyed by all this occurrence with wrong keys, hands not playing together, um, in a very Beethovenian fashion, goes into um, an outburst of bravura playing. And then he gets to a point and he stops on it, and this point is D major, which is not bad for us. It is the dominant of G major, so we're kinda in the in the right in the right ballpark. And where do we go from here? He's not sure, so let's just go back. But then he varies the dynamics. So the dynamics are also a part of the humor. The first time it comes, in the very beginning, is all piano. But then, when he tries it in the wrong key, in F major, it is a bit angry, so it's forte. And this time, when he tries it after a completely different passage, and it's like, oh, I can't escape this, he goes to forte immediately. And this is the point where he manages to escape this conundrum. Really? Yes. Really? Again, this idea of playing with our expectations, playing with timing, keeping us as listeners a little bit on edge and definitely participating in the theatre which unfolds in front of our eyes. This is done with wonderful understanding of the audience, of their expectations, of what they would expect from uh, this idea of playing the hands together, but also of how he manages the keys and the timings and the breaks. And then um, our second theme is um, lovely and elegant, and it very quickly goes from B major to B minor. And uh, this juxtaposition of B major and B minor in close proximity is especially apparent later on. And to me it sounds almost Schubertian. Um, in many of Schubert's songs and also in his sonatas, the transition from major to minor is immediate and it is very strong emotionally f for me. Um, and Beethoven is not often uh, to use this idea, but when he does it's, it's lovely and strong. Again, not together. And here the music goes into two different directions. So first he ends the exposition and he has to go back. So he does that. Though this time the exposition is to start in forte. But then it continues the same way. But then after he ends the exposition, for the second time, he should then continue to the development. This is the usual forking point in the, in the structure of the first movement. And he does that by using the exact same material. So we poor listeners think, no, is it possible that we'll, we'll have to go through this for the third time? And it seems so at first. But then he changes. So now this idea of the hands not being together is not humorous anymore. It is just part of the core of the music and he just works with it as if he would with any other kind of material. There is nothing humorous here. Probably he also understands that by this point we have heard this so many times that this is not novel anymore. This is something which we already know and recognize and almost expect. 
So the development is actually quite dramatic. And also not only is it dramatic, but it is also extremely uncomfortable. Because after these few passages, which are fine, then the rest is all semi-quavers in a very finger-breaking way. I'll play it one slowly. the same passage twice more in in different keys and these keys are uncomfortable and it is all fast and fortissimo and very very insistent and this insistency um, is repeated again <laughs> So he's still Beethoven and he's still a force of nature at the piano and he doesn't um, hesitate to use this in his writing, even inside what is otherwise a light-hearted and humorous piece. In a way, maybe he felt that a more serious core was needed to balance the otherwise light and humorous moments. And the end of the development, though, is pure theater. So we have, once again, these passages up and down, which he already used in the exposition. Though this time they cover not two octaves, but three. And he changes it into a dominant chord. And then, this idea of the hands not together comes and how. He's reached some kind of point of tension and then he really doesn't know what to do. And this tension between the D and the E flat is very strong. And to make it even stronger, because here they are very far apart, the next few bars will bring them really together. Just listen to this. And not only it's a uh, harmonic tension between the D and the E flat, but also their functions. This is something which is almost pleading. It's, it's quite personal. It has some kind of expression. And this D, that's the most dead pan thing one could, one could imagine. And this combination between something almost emotional please could we leave this area and like no i find i find i find i find wonderful and this and out of this comes the opening motif in fortissimo. So we had it first in piano, in the beginning of the sonata, then in forte, at the repeat of the exposition and the beginning of the development, and now it's fortissimo. And we go into our reprise, which repeats the same material, and then there is a lovely coda. So at the end of the reprise, he once again bursts out into this bravura passage. By the way, I, I, should, I should maybe point out that uh, this passage comes from... So he takes this second half of the opening motive and then repeats that. And then he goes up again to arrive at his D major. point where in the exposition he went back but not again because this was already the fifth or sixth time that we had this material so we have um, a lovely coda not together together not together not together not together together again this lovely interplay between 
I'm playing with your expectations, but the final chord will be together. Again. All, all, not just piano, but pianissimo, and he write it sempre pianissimo. Keep it down, this is for extra humorous effect. Because he wants this outburst of fortissimo, but the final ones are in piano. So wonderfully humorous ending to this movement. Again, perhaps at first hearing, this is not music which immediately grabs us in the same way as the, the, the appassionata or even the poetic beauty of, of the fourth concerto. But once you get to know what he does in the movement, it becomes really interesting and exciting, both I think for me as a performer, but hopefully also for uh, you as the listeners. The second movement is also unusual. Um, it is a very long, very slow movement in C major. C major can be many things. C major can be a key of purity, can be because it has no, no black um, uh, keys, it's just all white, so there are no flats, no sharps. Uh, so seeing it on the page, it's, it looks very clean. Um, it can be, in Beethoven's hands, a key of great energy. In the first concerto, or the pulsing energy of the Waldstein. It can be a key of transcendent beauty in the last movement of the last sonata. And here, for me, it, it, it borders on being maybe slightly bland. So why why did Beethoven write these very elegant, these classically beautiful lines in C major? We don't have an extra musical story to explain it, and thus musical critics and commentators were trying to find something. And the common uh, belief was that Beethoven was parodying opera, that this was to be the, a, an opera diva, who over ornaments her line um, and later there are even more trills and ornaments and runs up and down the keyboard and so they thought Beethoven was parodying opera and this was the this was the explanation I am not entirely sure uh, my reasons for not being sure are First of all, that if we are talking about opera, then this is not just an aria, but a duet, because later on, everything which the right hand is doing, the left hand is doing too. So there is a dialogue happening between the hands. But even so, there is for me something not quite matching between the idea of parody in general and the purity of this music. I, uh, Be Beethoven is not usually a parodying um, composer. Usually when he writes something, he really means it and he pours all his heart and soul into the music. So my interpretation of the movement would be to go from the um, indication of tempo, which is adagio grazioso, with grace, and to see how much choreography there is in the music. So we have here indications to play this as a long staccato. Um, so there is already a kind of motion implied in the fingers. Then after the trill we have here um, portato. 
which is an indication to play every note on its own with a lift of the arm in between. And then here we have these long jumps. Then jump up with a landing. Again. And a run. A jump. And thus the entire movement is full of hand choreography. So I prefer to see it not so much as an opera parody, but, but a very slow ballet for the fingers. Beautifully choreographed. The choreography is written inside the music. It's in the score. The long staccatos, portatos, staccatos, the runs up and down, the jumps then with a heavy uh, landing on the note. Um, everything already in the score just waiting to be reawakened into motion by the by the performer. Whether this is what he meant, I do not know. I do see enough indications in the score that the idea of different kinds of motion seem to be very important to him in this movement. This is not to say that he doesn't write articulation in general, of course he does, but such a variety of articulation and such a meticulous attention to different articulations in different hands within the same bar is something which is somewhat striking, is not very, very common. And thus, this is my angle of approach to this movement. Um, the question of tempo is interesting as well, because one option of making this less long would be to take a faster tempo. We could take a tempo which is not from these notes, but from one, two, three, one, two. But then we stumble because in bar 10, he writes the following right hand. So this is bar nine. And this is bar 10. And again. And this is written um, leggeramente, so it should be light and not a bravura passage, so it should be just gentle and elegant. So if we take a tempo which is much faster, these bars will become either unplayable or they will have to be forced. You will have to play them quite loudly just to be able to play all the notes in tempo. So in a way, these bars that are repeated several times throughout the movement, they give us more of indication of what is possible in terms of how fast this movement could go. And if we take it from there, then we arrive once again in this slow motion elegance. Then the middle section, sorry, before I talk about the middle section, um, I have to say there are a few moments also of dramatic beauty here. Pianissimo. Color. As you said, uh, C major can be a very neutral, bland key, but here he adds a lot of chromaticism. And again, even more unusual. And then after uh, this passage, there is a cadenza, which could be a little bit operatic or pianistic. That's another reason why I find the idea of opera parodying to be not quite convincing, because the writing, despite the choreography and everything, is so pianistic. Like this passage, it is pure mechanical piano writing. Mechanical, not in a bad sense, but in a way that he knows how the hand works and what is possible 
using the hand. This is something that the hand can do very easily. Or this passage, for example. This kind of cadenza-like passages are all throughout his writing in his concerti, even in some of his sonatas. So this is a pianistic device which he uses quite often. Anyway, the middle section offers us some genuine drama. Um, we go to C minor. Now over this boiling accompaniment. We have a very atmospheric line. Tension build up. Again, there's a lot of articulation. This is legato. And this is long staccato. And over this, this is very legato, floating. And... We arrive at a purely orchestral section. You can imagine strings holding this chord. Again, some kind of dialogue between the hands. Uh, uh, it is very light. Skips and jumps. So once again, a lot of hand choreography here. And a bit of um, genuine drama. Mm -hmm. out of it. This is harmonically perhaps the most interesting moment of the entire movement. It's like Dali's um, melting watches. These harmonies melting into one another. Also these dissonances. there's a transition back to the reprise, coming out from the drama and slight darkness back into the um, beautiful world. And here's our reprise. And what's quite unusual here is that he adds variations and ornamentations not to the right hand in addition to what he's already written, but rather the left hand. The left hand previously was... And now... Which is one other reason not to choose a tempo which is too fast, because if we take a tempo from here... By the time we get here... This then sounds too hectic, too active, because this should still be as elegant. As everything which had been before. And the same beautiful ornamented lines in the right hand. So it is all very beautiful and here by this point already there's so much happening that the danger of it being bland is not there anymore. The cadenza line, which he repeats of course, is even more expanded. So 
So it goes up to D. Again. And now to F. To F again. And then he descends. If there is one place where the idea of parody could be applied is perhaps this passage, because it is really extravagant. It's almost like a bird of paradise or a peacock showing off their magnificent plumage. Um, there is a coda and the coda has a little bit more color. A little bit. This A flat comes quite often as a um, slightly emotional moment of color, but then it immediately goes back into the G. But again, and again, and I find the ending really poetic. Again, these little skips and jumps. So choreography until the last moment. And this is the second movement. Whether you agree to the idea that this is operatic or you agree to the idea that this is uh, ballet-like or perhaps neither of these, but it is a movement in which I think both as performers, as listeners, th there's something lovely in just letting go, not trying to find an exact narrative here and just enjoy the, these classically beautiful landscapes passing by as you float on the, on the river of this music. The finale for me is the, the, the most beautiful and most enjoyable to play movement of the sonata. Like the first movement, it is also a pocket universe and the what if question that Beethoven asks here is altogether more subtle. He asks what if there are no downbeats, if there are no strong beats. So this idea of a, of a one beat in a bar which is stronger, more emphasized than all the others, is something again so fundamental to classical music. We say this is in triple time, it means there is a strong one and a light 2-3. This is in common time, in 4-4, four, four. so the one is strong, 2-3-4 are weaker. So this uh, movement is in two, but again, in two we would expect there to be a strong one and a light 2. But here he does everything he can to avoid us feeling that there is a strong beat. So we start... So, it is usually a trick question for a teacher to ask the student. Uh, is it... Or is it... And my answer to that, that it is neither. It is very clearly the purpose of this music to avoid both options. It shouldn't be a downbeat here. There shouldn't be a downbeat here because everything Beethoven does is to keep the flow going. It 
because and if we thought that this is the end he, he puts a sforzando immediately after on the weak beat to avoid us feeling that he we arrived here said no, no no we're gonna continue and so it goes throughout the entire movement um, especially in the coda which I'll show later but this movement is so beautifully and lovingly written that it also functions without any analysis at all um, it is very imaginative uh, for example listen to these um, shimmering harmonies in the transition to the reprise I find it really beautiful. And even the transition itself, he takes one, two, three, three and a half bars of just this. And it has a double function. One, it is in diminuendo, so after the dramatic development, we want to come back to the light mood of the opening. But also, because it's three and a half bars, it serves to disor disorientate us. We should lose once again, any bearings as to where we are in the bar, and he wants us to feel that this is just just happening. And then, as I mentioned, there is a coda. So the coda starts with quite an unusual chromatic passage, which is moreover is polyphonic. So there is another voice. And now this voice starts. So a lot of harmonic tension and uncertainty of where we are in terms of the key until we reach this point and we realize that we are in our G major area. But then he takes this um, idea, which we had, and he works with it. Now, the rest of a coda is a, is a full theatrical scene. So we start as if it were the beginning again. stops for an entire bar, then the next bit is written adagio, which could be played twice as slow. A whole bar of a pause. Once again, the beginning in first tempo. But now, going to a different harmony. A adagio once again. And now twice as slow. So we are completely lost in terms of tempo and downbeats. We have no idea where the downbeats are anymore at all. He gets out of it. Now again, this long, empty stretch to disorientate us. And out of this comes a presto part of the coda. This, by the way, is the most uncomfortable bit of the entire sonata. It should be in forte, very precise and presto. So uh, we have uh, then a fast beat. But again, where are we in the bar? Okay, strong beat. It's like every time he gives us one strong beat, he immediately once again takes it back. Uh, where we are, how many bars? Apart from those who play, no one has any idea. 
and then the right hand interrupt is like enough we need something more solid than but this is not the downbeat this is the downbeat this is one two three four and like the first movement he ends the sonata in piano and on weak beats This is the weakest point possible. Not only it is the second beat of the bar, but also within the four, um, four bar group, it is on the sixth position. So it's neither on the fifth, neither on the eighth, which would have been strong bits. Because just imagine, this feels like we're finished. One, two, three, four, five. But instead what we get is Do we think maybe he will continue going to the eight? But no, it's just so. This is Sonata number sixteen. A small personal story to tell about it. Uh, when I was a teenager, my teacher suggested that I play it, and I looked through the score. And as a teenager, I saw none of this. I didn't see this humor. I didn't see his uh, what if questions. It just seemed to me not very awesome. And then I asked my teacher to play Sonata number 28 instead, which I thought was incredible and I still do. But now coming back to the music, I understand both why I felt this way as a teenager, but also how superficial and ultimately how wrong this reading of the Sonata was. And this is music which Perhaps it's more delight for the mind than for the heart, but it is, I, I truly believe it is one of the most original sonatas which Beethoven has written.